Discipline is the bridge between goals and accomplishment. Jim Rohn said that. Bryson, what does that mean to you? It means unless, when I hear discipline, I equate it to commitment and consistency. So unless you have commitment and consistency, then you won't be able to get from point A to point Z, which is goals and accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I, I, I think of when I hear that. And going back in prison where I've acquired my discipline that was channeled in the right direction. Because I always had discipline towards the negative stuff. You know, I put every ounce of blood, tears, and sweat into the gang lifestyle. But putting it into the positivity, I understood the meaning on a deeper level. Because a lot of stuff I was doing unconsciously. You know, yeah, I was committed, but it was unconscious. It, it's not until we, we read books like yours to where we're able to put it into words and identify it to where now we're able to maximize that. Mm. You know, so. Nice. Well said. So welcome to the channel, everybody. Uh, this is How to Battle. And today I got a very special guest, good friend, uh, CEO, filmmaker, thought leader, visionary, and just an incredible human being. Um, that provides so much value to everybody he encounters. So today I'm here with Bryson McCauley. McCauley, right? It. Yes, McCauley. Okay. I could I never... 5% Irish. You know? Got it, got it. Yeah. <laughs> right? But um, yeah, it, it's... This is um, an important interview because this is like a goal accomplished today. Because we used to talk about this in prison when we used to be in the law library Definitely. and our mastermind groups um, in a place like that. And all we really had was dreams, goals, and visions that helped us get through those tough days. Like whole, grasping on to those moments um, that we truly felt like we were going to do this one day. right? And so to be here today to interview you here at my office... Um, you came, you drove out here, what, like two hours to get here? Two and a half. Two and a half hours yeah. to do this. We've been talking about it even before you walked out. Definitely. And now you're out of prison. So please um, share with the audience who you are, um, your story, um, and also just like what is something that you feel through your story as you tell it, um, highlights important things within there that you feel that the listeners uh, would would value would gain some value from. Mm -hmm. All right. So first and foremost, my name is Bryson McCauley, the CEO and founder of Last of a Dying Seed, where we use cinematic scenes to uh, uh, uncover unseen narratives in the real world. You know, we pair in depth interviews with movies, and my story is: I grew up in the criminal and gang culture through and through. It wasn't just outside, it was inside the household. My father was an OG from his hood. I was born and raised in Long Beach. All my brothers were gang members. I'm the youngest of four boys. So that's what I knew. Even before I was able to put words to it or label it, I was already indoctrinated, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm learning their way of behaving and reacting and, you know, the way they respond to situations, what's right and what's wrong based on mm. their standards. So when people say right and wrong, like my wrongs was right. Like you couldn't mm. tell me no different because this is all I knew. You know, some people knew right from wrong, but if this is all I knew, this was my right. right. So my father, when I was six years old, he allowed me to hold a shotgun. You mm. know, I'm six. So it's like I remember how heavy it felt. I remember seeing the guy that's supposed to be my role model let me know it's cool to brandish weapons mm -hmm. and told me to pull the trigger. So as I got older, I began to see my brothers brandishing, you know, and the reasons behind why they doing so. So I'm like, wow. I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. guns is cool. One day I'm going to need one. You know, when I was eight years old, my father got shot right in front of our apartment, mm -hmm. you know, and walked it off. So now I'm seeing... <laughs> How you supposed to respond to trauma like that? Right. If you're not dead, get back in the game. That's what I'm learning. When I was 14, my brother Tyson, who I looked up to so much, he got shot in the hand. 
but yet he was still out there in the field. So I'm like, this is how you respond to stuff like that. So eventually, it was inevitable for me. I got into it. I jumped off the porch, as, as we say. And when my brother Tyson was convicted of attempted murder at 16 years old, that did something to me. That was my biggest turning point. I had a lot of gradual ones, like all of us who grew up in the hood, but that was the biggest one to where the lights in me just cut all the way off. You know, because he's sitting there in that courtroom and gets taken away for 25 years, and I just couldn't believe it. Like, literally, I couldn't believe they about mm -hmm. to take him away for 25 when this is what we do. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this is normal. This, this is what goes on. So I felt like society committed injustice against me. I took that personally. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I got out there. I just turned up even more, you know, as a way of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, y'all, this is what y'all want to do? All right, watch this. Right. And I just start terrorizing every second of every minute. And at 18 years old, I caught three attempts. It was facing three life, well, five life sentences because of the special allegations and stuff like that. But I was fighting multiple life sentences at 18 years old and eventually got took a plea for 30 years at 19 years old and hit, the, hit prison. And I still had a chip on my shoulder, still had anger problems, still thought my past, my old belief system was the right belief system and that I needed, I even needed even more now. Because mm -hmm. now I'm on a yard where all this negativity is concentrated now. So I went through that whole experience as a young dude, you know, trying to get active every second of every minute until I had older men who already done walked the line for so long, letting me know I ain't got to do all that. I ain't got to be out there so much. Mm -hmm. I got to do this, this and that and gave me really my starting point from where I took it from there. You know, which came a lot of came from reading books, you right. know, and knowing things not only about life, but about myself that I didn't know. Right. You yeah. know, and once my mind began to open it up and I gained some insight, which was connected to both hindsight and foresight, mm -hmm. I began to see the error of my ways in the past. Yeah. You know, and I I started to change my, my thought process, which then changed my behavior, which then created a whole different type of circumstance for me to where I was released after 15 years on that 30 year sentence. And now I sit with you today. Nice. Hold that thought. I don't know what happened here. Well, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, no, I was recording this, didn't you? All right. There we go. Oh, damn. The TV, like, man, y'all talking so much power. You drain no, my know. power. You know what I'm saying? There's so much there that we got to dig into. Right. And it's crazy because my mind was going fast. I'm thinking about answering the stuff that he already answered, but I'm like, you might ask me those questions, so stay away from it. Yeah, I was yeah. about to start touching on the worst experience and all. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, yeah. nah, 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 stay away from that. No, we're we're gonna get into that. Yeah. Wait a second. Always some technical difficulties going on. All right. This thing will go away. All right. Okay. So going back, you said that you witnessed your brother getting shot. Just want to touch on that for a second. Um, a person gets shot that I know today, right? That's like such a traumatic experience. Like, I mean, you go to the hospital, you probably get help psychologically. Um, it impacts the family. People move, relocate. So much can happen now like that I'm out and I see like the world as it is. A person getting shot is a huge deal. So the fact that he got shot and he went right back out there, like that's just a part of the way this is in this world that we live in. All right, we shoot each other. We retaliate because of the reason why, because of the reason why we got shot. Like this, this is the way of thinking, right? And so you're growing up at, th at that age and you're seeing these things 
and you're being influenced by these things, right? So how much did that play a part in like you leading up to doing whatever you did to go to prison, which was um, what? What do you, would you go to prison for? For three attempts, three robberies, two assaults, and they gave me gun enhancement, gang enhancement initially right. until yeah. I took a plea for one attempt, one assault, one robbery, gun enhancement, gang enhancement. Right. And then how much time did you take? Uh, 30. 30 years. At, so yep. you took 30 years when you were how old? 19. 19. And how is that? You're 19 years old and you take a deal for 30 years. That's right. like more than you've been on earth. Definitely. Right? Definitely. So how do you take that deal? Like how does, what's going on in your head when you take that deal? Man, it's like, it was a numbing type feeling. It was like numb. It's like, you, I felt the calm in my spirit that I never felt before. It was so yeah. calm, like, yeah. like, like you know you about to sit for a long time, if you ever get out, because initially I took it as life with my old mentality. I said, the way I am, I'm about to get cracking. I'm not yeah. about to just do that date. Like, yeah. so I'm going to end up catching life in there. You know, and I had people like, man, yeah, that's why you shouldn't have took it. And I'm like, nah, but I had people coming on that was willing to come on the stand on me. So yeah. I, I took it. And initially, I was going to fight it to go to trial and fight it. But the DA ended up scaring my dad. He scared me. So right, <laughs> I'm yeah. like, no, nah, all right, I, I'll yeah. take it. You know, and... Just to glance back and, and see your mom like looking at you like, you know, trying to hold herself yeah. together because I'm the youngest of four. She's been experiencing this for decades, Yeah, you know, from my dad all the way down to my brothers. So now I'm her baby and I get banged with 30. Yeah. So only after doing time and growing and gaining insight that I realized how much I was rushing her to her grave. Mm with the stress I was putting on her, you know? But when it initially hit me, I'm just like, I got to strap up because my mindset was still just on survival. I'm a yeah. part of something. Did you ever feel like, because I felt this way, like, I, do you ever feel like that, like when, when you're in a gang, um, you're going to prison is something that's necessary to really truly be respected and admired in that world. Because most of the people that I looked up to in, in my neighborhood had been to prison already. They had that under their belt as like a, it's like a badge of honor. Do you feel that was the same for you? Do you feel like that you, in some way, our identities required that we went to prison to solidify like who we really were? Most definitely, yeah. yeah. Uh, growing up, in my, my mind, from what I've seen, going to prison was like a rite of passage. Yeah. That's how you get your stripes up. So I knew I was going to prison. You know, we could dodge the police as much as we want. It was more so funny games dodging the police. Yeah. But I knew I was going to prison. You know, my whole thing is let me mm. just get it in as much as possible now before I go. Yeah. That was my warp mentality. And my brother's been in and out, and they made it seem like it was the thing to do. All the things that I've seen while in prison wasn't even spoken about. The things that really turn you off, even in that mind frame, mm -hmm. which is the confinement. You know, and what that can do to you mm. on lockdown years at a time, right. you know, which is uh, uh, being stripped naked by a mm -hmm. grown man. You're a grown man. You're being stripped naked by a grown man telling you to squat and cough consistently. So it's like nobody talked about that when I was a kid. Right. Like, or even just Jeez. I want to even touch on just those who still banging right now. You're out there chasing down your own kind calling them your enemy. But when you're in certain cities of where your enemies is at, when you go to prison, now y'all homies. And y'all saving each other. Y'all yeah. feeding each other. Y'all giving each other knowledge. Y'all embracing each other. Y'all mm -hmm. keeping oofs on each other. Y'all going to war. You're willing to die with this person if a race riot crack off or with another car, but yet on the streets, you're putting all this time and energy trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to reflect on that much, yeah. you know, which I came to that realization while being in here. And I'm like, what the, what's this? Mm -hmm. What is we doing? But most of all, what am I doing? Yeah. And so. I thought that's a powerful thing because uh, for those that don't know out there, like I'm a, I, I was a Pyru, right? And, and Bryson was a Crip. Right. Right. And as, and as everybody knows, like on the streets, we're enemies. Right. It doesn't matter, like, in my mind back then, any crit was an enemy to me. Right. 
And I didn't even, and I could have ran into you and you said, I'm a crip and we would have tried to kill each other. Right. Go to prison, it's like me and you become the best of friends. Right. Like I, I didn't look at you like how I used to look at you, like an enemy. I looked at you as a person who had so much like, so much intelligence and so much substance and just like so much potential. And I was attracted to that because I know that I had that within myself. So it's like that went out the window when you start, when you start to run into great people you don't care about where, they, where they're from, what they look like, anything. And so a lot of people um, out there, like you said, that are killing each other because of these different um, things that they represent, you really don't know. That other person could be a person that saves your life in prison. Right. You know, and so exactly. um, looking at the individual for who they are and not from where they're from is a right. huge part of uh, surviving in prison, but also in successful out here. Right. right? So how important do you think that is? Like... Um, because we all have our biases, we all have our ways of looking at things, our perspective, our beliefs in some way. But how important is it for you today to have like a diversity way of thinking, a diverse way of looking at things and, and being able to connect with people from all different walks of life? How important is that for somebody who's just getting started and needs to become, wants to become successful in their business or in life? Right. Yeah. It's very important because it's, it's it allows you to build the best relationships, not just a relationship, but the best relationships when you judge people based on their character and not their they color. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You judge them based on their integrity and not uh, the rag that they got in their back pocket. And I had to learn that in prison because it was people outside of my hood that did more for me than my own homies. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Even, see, Long Beach, anybody who know Long Beach, is racist, purely, you know, and I'm not going to touch on specific hoods, but that's the mentality I had going into prison. And it wasn't until I went to the hole for the first time that I had like a, a, a rude awakening. You know, I walked past all these cells going to my cell. Mm -hmm. Boom. Blacks, every race. The first race that called out to us was Hispanics. Mm -hmm. These are the ones we hate through and through, supposedly. Mm -hmm. They called out to us. They just wanted to know, hey, y'all, you still active? Which means mm -hmm. you're still good. You didn't roll it up. You didn't, right. and then that. Like, yeah. All right, I'm going to shoot my line. I'm like, no, nah, we cool. Right. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, it's, it's good. It's good. Shot food, coffee, mm -hmm. all immediately. Yeah. And I'm like, what? They supposed mm -hmm. to hate me. Yeah. You know, I didn't hear from the blacks a whole day, the next day. Yeah. I didn't accept nothing from them. No, I'm good, you know. So I went through experiences that caused me to remove that 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 shell I was in, you know, mm -hmm. of being dark ruthless and unapproachable to these strangers that I didn't even know. You know, these people yeah. who I call I labeled my enemy who wasn't even my enemy until I chose to call them my enemy. Yeah, you know, so it's it's deep, and I feel like once I remove that, I start building the best relationships from all sides, all walks of life. Yeah, and you have a unique experience because you you went to prison and were actually on the yard with your brother, right? The brother that you looked up to, right? The brother that you admired and wanted to be like, um, walk in the footsteps that he left. Um, talk about that. It was it was like Hollywood couldn't write a better story, you know. Like, right. uh, he left at sixteen, I left at eighteen. We we haven't seen each other up until that point for like thirteen years, you know. He he never seen me bounce off the porch and do everything I was mm -hmm. doing. He was just hearing about it. So it's like after all that time, we finally linked up by the grace of God and. It was crazy. Like first seeing him that night at the night yard, I was like numb emotionally because I've been on my own for so long. Mm -hmm. So it was still like mentally, I know I'm happy to see you, but emotionally I was always like solitary, like because I was by myself the whole time. You know, mm -hmm. even when they was out, they was already banging and doing them. So mm -hmm. even though I seen their activity when they came in the house, I still wasn't like a part of their squad or nothing. So. Yeah. I always felt like I had that I'm by myself. So when I seen him, I'm like, yeah, all right, bro, I'm, I'm happy. But mm -hmm. emotionally, it had to build up 
of us being in the cell, going over stories, right. how I used to be as kids. And that's when it started to become more emotional for me. But, like, it was divine, though, because if we would have linked up years prior to that, we was both, like, still, like, even though we was gaining knowledge, yeah. we was masterminds in the worst way, though, because we were yeah. still involved, very actively involved, both of us. So we linked up at a point in time to where it was perfect. It was mm. perfect. Like, we both on a whole different journey and trajectory in life. Yeah. You know, he became a Muslim, and I go to, I, I build on a spiritual level, but, like, we was able to benefit each other at that point and from mm -hmm. that point on and still yeah. to this day. And your brother's out now, right? He's out now. He got out four months before me. Yeah. So we was both able to see my dad before he passed and it was good. Wow. That's, a, that's incredible. Tyson and, and Bryson. Right. Yeah, I remember I was, we were all in the yard together. That's where I right, first right. met both of you. And uh, you guys have similarities, but also so unique in your own way. You know, you got different qualities, but you can tell there's certain things there that are like, that you can know that's your brother. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. So in prison, tell me a time that like really resonates with you, a moment, an act, an event that really resonates with you in a good or bad way. Good or bad. You know, I'm going to go with the good because the bad just yeah. overflows. And <laughs> I'll be here all day trying to think of one, but... I'm going to think of the good because when my life has been bad for so long, the good just is so, it was so impactful, you mm -hmm. know. And that was when in 2013, I pulled somebody from my car in the cell. All right. Now, this person was well known for just doing destructive things in prison, you know what I'm saying, in the worst way. And he couldn't read or write. I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. By him coming in the cell, I was on my growth, you know? So I'm like, this is what we doing. Yeah. We studying words out the dictionary, you know? He yeah. like, he tried to resist it without telling me he couldn't read. So, mm -hmm. but then when he finally confessed, I didn't judge him. Like, come yeah. on, man, I was, with my lifestyle, who am I to judge anybody? So I'm like, nah, it's good. Like, yeah. so I was teaching him how to read and learn the dictionary. And if we forget one word, I don't care if it's a vowel, uh, the letter A, as we recite these words, you you use the bathroom one in the morning. And I'm like, hey, what does this word mean? I done caught you. And if you miss one word, you got to hit some push-ups. So that's mm. the program we was on. Yeah. You know, and I was just building, having great conversations with stuff that he wasn't used to. So I didn't think nothing of it. I'm just my program already. Yeah. Boom. I go to the hole, as I just mentioned. When I get out, he's in another building. He wrote me a kite. We call them kites, notes, and all that. Yeah. So he said, man, you saved my life. That was the mm -hmm. first line. I'm like, what? So he said, man, I couldn't read or write. My mind was on destructive. I didn't care about nothing. I got life already. Yeah. So what? You know, he said, but you helping me gain knowledge helped me gain an understanding of myself. And understanding myself helped me understand how much value I had. You know what I'm saying? And he like, you saved my life. And that's... It made me teary out. I'm like, damn, I, don't, I ain't never felt like what it, say, what it felt like to save a life before. Yeah. I was so busy on doing other things, you know what I'm saying? So knowing how I was on both sides now, I'm like, oh, this is powerful. Yeah. It's deep. I got to continue this, you know what I'm saying? So that's the path I've been on. That's deep. And that's such a powerful thing because and people don't know that in prison, um, you know, it's always like... You know, either it's it's like always good or bad. It's like positive or negative in the most dramatic way. Exactly. So like either it's just a horrible situation, a horrible celly, which we've all had, uh, a horrible place, a horrible right. yard, a horrible war, whatever it is. And then there's like you go in the cell with that good person, and it's like a breath of fresh air, and it's like this is a person who just wants to help you become better. And you don't know this person, you just met him, but like you, like you, you find out like, okay, here's somebody who doesn't know how to read and write, I'm gonna help him right. to become better, All right? And I think that's such a powerful thing in a place like prison, because in prison, um, I think you, we look for opportunities 
to express our humanity, to express those the good heart that we have. Right. And like when we find those opportunities, we do them. And it's like the most important place to do them in prison. And so like out here, like the work that we're doing, um, I know a lot of it is like to give and to help and to inspire and to motivate and to teach, to educate like you do through your channel. Like, like there's something there that's like that, that's always been within us. And even in prison, we were doing it just in the way that we could, and now right. we're doing it out here. Right. So when we talk about stories like that, like the one you experienced with him, um, it's important for the listeners to understand that in prison, um, not everybody is bad. Not everybody is trying to is a horrible person that you wouldn't want to be your neighbor. Some of the people in prison are the greatest people I've ever met in my life. Actually, they are. Right. And the people that I've met in prison are the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Right. And I've met some amazing people today, and I'm telling you, like, like if it was to like, if we all started with nothing and I had to choose five people to build something with, four out of the five people would have been people I've been in prison with. Uh -huh. So there's so many valuable people in there that just need a second chance, uh -huh. right? And so, um, so I, I wanna know like now, like for you today, you've been out how long? Uh, going on 10 months. 10 months, right? In 10 months you've been out. <laughs> So crazy to think that. You've been out 10 months. What is a goal and dream that you have for yourself down the line? Like, where do you want to be in whatever amount of time? Um, and, and like, what is a, your legacy that you want to leave behind? Um, all right, so a goal and dream that I have is to build, you know, it sounds cliche because a lot of people use the word empire, but excuse me, I really want to build a film and media empire on a global scale. Like my those who know me, they they know like this seeps through my pores. It's my oxygen, you mm -hmm. know, and to and my drive is like I'm not about to stop. So my whole thing is to build a a, a global film, excuse me, film and media empire. And impact lives through storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm passionate about it. You know, after studying, you know, just the the academic standpoint of storytelling, the artistic side, and knowing that storytelling it really helps people to develop as mm -hmm. a, as a people. You yeah. know, every society, every culture, ancient civilization use storytelling mm -hmm. to carry traditions to tell people how to move, you yeah. know, to help people become civilized. It's storytelling, you know, and it's also used for other means, but, you know, just the power of it, you know, my whole, I'm going to use storytelling to give society as cues on how to behave in the world. Right. You know what I'm saying? And give other people the, the power to control their narrative in life. Yeah. So, boom, and then put myself in a position to where I want to, I mean, money is not everything, but my mom has been struggling for so long that I want to be in a position to where she see a whole M before she leave mm -hmm. this earth. Yeah. That's just me personally. You know what I'm saying? And what I want my story to be when I leave, the things I want to still linger in this universe when I'm gone is like he's a prime example that change is possible for anybody. Because I didn't see how dark it can get. I was there. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who kept the light out at times. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then to go and become the light, to see the light, you know, and show people how far their life can go beyond the physical eye can see. Like, that's, like, I want them to talk like that, mm -hmm. you know, because that's not, and that's not monetary. It's all about impacting lives. You know, that's what yeah. gives you that staying power. That's beautiful. And last of a dying seed, where does, where does that come from? And why is it an important title name for this empire you're building? Um, because it's like a child, I feel like when we build something, a company, a, a, a brand, whatever it is, it's like our child. And so I know when you name a child, there's a significance behind that. There's an important reason, a meaning. What, what does last of a dying seed mean? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so it that I the label was sparked from 
a conversation I had with a childhood friend. Now, I went to a uh, parole board and got granted parole on my first hearing, and I was still sitting in the cell like the work is not done, you know? So I was talking to a childhood friend and just having a reality check with him, you know? I'm like, bro, out of all the people you initiated into this lifestyle, everybody you led, where are they all at? Mm. And he was quiet. And I'm like, bro, they either dead, in jail, or still trying to figure it out, playing with their nose. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not innocent. Everybody I taught, dead, in jail, or still trying to figure it out, playing with their nose. And I'm like, nah, bro. I'm like, all our seeds done died off. And then after the phone call, I think it was later on that night, it just hit me, last of a dying seed. I'm like, everything we produce from here on now is going to bear fruit. Every life we touch, they gonna, they gonna get something from it. And people being getting it, I just didn't have a name for it, mm -hmm. you know, cause I was on this path. So that's when I came with the name Last of a Dying Seed. And mm -hmm. here we are today. Yeah, I love that. What do you tell, I work with a lot of young people. What do you tell a young person growing up, streets of Long Beach, um, they're like nine years old, they're in the gang life, their family's in the gang life, they know somebody that's gotten shot. What would you tell them today? I would tell them, you have a choice. You have a choice. You can go this way, which, and this is what's going to happen. I wish this was a fantasy movie. I could just snap my finger and they could <laughs> see everything we went through. Everything all of us went through. Yeah. In a blink of a snap, boom. And yeah. then wake them up. But it's like you have a choice and you can choose not to do that and you can choose to do that. And the people that encourage you to do that, they're not going to be there for the most part. And the ones that are, they don't even care about their life. How they going to care about you in the righteous way? You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, and not only that, look what you're doing to your mom, the people that really love you. You know what I'm saying? Like, we pushing them to the grave even sooner than what they supposed to be through stress, through, you know, having brain aneurysms for worrying about us. And every time they hear a siren, like, we gave them PTSD, mm. you know, right. through our actions. And we think that it's okay, that it's not a big deal. So I will cause him to see the reality check on that. Like, what if you get some, some enemies and... By trying to shoot at you, they hit your mom. Yeah. Trying to shoot at you, they hit your daughter. Yeah. Trying to shoot at you, they hit somebody you love to where to live with that thought sometimes can be worse than just dying yourself. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So I would just, me, I like to paint scenarios. I'm a storyteller. So mm -hmm. I would just paint scenarios for him so that he can understand the consequences of the choices that he's thinking about in that moment. Yeah. You know, and then give them a trade off. See, a lot of it wouldn't have worked for me because nobody came with a trade off. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like you yeah. tell me all this, but what's your trade off? You about to leave and I'm still in the hood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I would you like what you're doing. You coming with a trade off. You're physically present. You're willing to take them out and do things in life. That's yeah. that trade off. But if you're just telling me this and leaving, it's like, I ain't trying to hear that. Yeah. So I would, I would not only paint scenario, but I'll give them a trade off. Yeah. And in a way, it's like you kind of doing that through your work, through your art form on YouTube, um, Last of a Dying Seed, because you're like you're interviewing people and you're like connecting their experiences and stuff through, through films, right? Right. And so these are people, these aren't just regular people, though, that you're interviewing. These are people that have been through stuff. Right. Some of them, well in prison and other stuff, right? And so um, when a young person stumbles across your YouTube channel and they see somebody that they may, that may look familiar to them, right? Like, because a person that's incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, that could be like an uncle to them. And they see that person talking about their life and connecting it to a film. Maybe that's the inspiration that moves them in a different direction or starts, it creates something in them to start exploring something differently, like film, you know, like seeing you create that channel, maybe they go start to get into that industry. Right. And that's the trade-off that you're creating without even really trying. Right. So it's like, in a way, you're kind of already doing that, which is what I've noticed. Um, 
and and it's it's sometimes we don't even notice what we're doing right i think because a lot of times we are such high achievers that we don't like really acknowledge the impact we're creating because right. we have such big goals and dreams but i definitely see that right so uh just keep doing that man and like creating and use using your gifts to create an impact Right. And it'll hit the people that need to see it when they need to see it. Right. And it's crazy right. when you say that, right? Speaking of impact real quick, it's like I knew this is intended to make an impact, but it's certain situations like when Joseph Bivens that's on the channel who, who related his life to 12 years of slave, he's been mm -hmm. down 50 years now and counting, right? So he cried on the phone with me. He like he said, 50 years, I never had nobody that was willing to share my story. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's stuff like that that's like, yeah, this is what you're meant to do. It's confirmations mm. like that, affirmations like that that's like, yeah, this is what yeah. you're meant to do. You Now his, the man is 50 years in prison. He may never get out, right? Right. You have created um, a way to where his story, his voice lives on. Right. It'll always be here, even after he dies. Like that is always going to be there, recorded and in in on YouTube and circulating the world for people to hear this man's story. Like you gave him uh, like purpose. You gave him something now. Like he sleeps at night knowing, like, okay, my story's out there. Somebody might hear it. Right. So that's a powerful thing. Exactly. But we sometimes we overlook that. But yeah, I think that um, that's a great example of the impact you're making on one individual, but then also everybody who hears it is right. going to be impacted by that. Right. So, but before you go, I want you, well, first of all, um, my book, Warrior in the Garden, um, Bryson wrote the foreword for this book. And it was meant to be, because I always asked him, I wanted, I always asked him to write the foreword to my book before I even thought of this idea. Even after I wrote my first book, um, I didn't do a foreword for that book. Because uh, you weren't even out, right? But I know had you been out, you would have been wrote that right. one. But you had the opportunity to write the forward in here. So um, if you would do me a favor and read the forward, so that way people can hear your voice. Right? Right. People may read that. It would be great to be able to hear you hear it come from you. All right. Um, if you would. All right. First of all, I appreciate you for even blessing me with the opportunity to write the forward. You know. Mm -hmm. So and it say. Top of the world, my name is Bryson McCauley, the founder and CEO of Last of a Dying Seed. I met Carlos in Sentinella State Prison over five years ago. We initially heard about each other through a mutual friend who knew both of our mindsets and told both of us about each other. Once we connected, we started building from day one. I worked in the law library in 2020, and once a week, I would make sure Carlos and four other guys got ducked it to come to the library. There, we gathered in a book room and shared, studied, and built on ideas. Now we are free, and we're still building together. To this day, I'm inspired by Carlos's work ethic and am a student of his perspective, a couple of which are embedded in this book slash guide. I truly believe that every chapter deserves its own roundtable discussion from the highest minds, but rule two, earn your bones, really hit differently for me. When I was growing up, I learned that if you wanted power and respect, you had to earn it. And you earned it by making decisions that were respected by those whom you wanted respect from. Honor follows suit because honor came from integrity, which came from the sacrifices one was willing to make for what he believed in. Going to prison, where I was stripped of every materialistic thing that gave one social status in the, other wor in the outer world, all I had was my name, my respect, my honor. It was there that I better understood what it meant to be a man of integrity, not just within my circle of friends, but across cultures. I became a better man because of that 15 year experience. Remember, not to just read this book, but to study it. No matter who you are, where you are, or what you do, your honor is honor. It is the key to gaining staying power in the minds and hearts of people around the world. In the movie Donna, the Planet of the Apes, Caesar is a prime example of earning your bones and being an honorable leader. Caesar earned his leadership position through his actions and decisions, not just by birthright or force. He demonstrates wisdom, compassion, and strategic thinking. 
which earned him the respect and loyalty of his fellow apes. He also led by example, embodying the values and honors and integrity he expects from others. He remained true to his principles even in the face of betrayal and adversity, showing unwavering commitment to his ideals. Overall, Caesar's actions serve a per powerful example of how earning respect and honor is not just about personal gain, but about making decisions that are respected and honorable. So remember, he who is willing to earn his bones earns the willpower from the people to advance him. Nice. Nice. Respect is earned. And definitely uh, you've earned that and continue to earn it. And for every young man out there or man out there, um, that's one of the rules. Like you have to earn it. It right. can't be expected to be given to you. Right. So, you know, earn that through keeping your word, through being an honorable person, right. sticking to your commitments. And so I thank you for writing that. And um, how can people find you, support you, follow you, contribute to what you're doing, um, share everything that you're doing and how people could reach you. Uh, you can find me on Last of a Dying Seed, and that's dying without the I, D-Y-N-G. Last of a Dying Seed on Instagram, one word, on YouTube, Last of a Dying Seed. Uh, those are the main two platforms that I'll be on. Uh, Facebook, World Class Visionaire. And we, we continue to create content. We created, I'm starting to create movies now, you know, so short films. And we're working on this trailer film, Rich Roller, if I could put it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, a fa sci-fi fantasy. And that's it, you know. So Nice. Congratulations, man. Thank you for uh, being here and sharing your story, your journey, uh, what you're doing. And um, I look forward to continuing to like grow with you and collaborate with you to right. really make an impact in this world. Right, appreciate so, it. Thank you.